don't come. And then I'll hide. Okay. Now, in this class, let's start to uh, do something about separation of variables because um, here shows some partial equations. I think you have learned some uh, theories about the partial equation solutions from uh, previous lectures. Uh, and we know the solution for the left one and the right, right one uh, is expen exponential equations and the sine cosine equations. So here are the solutions. For the first equation, uh, this is a, a function of X. So capital X is a function of small x and capital Y is a function of uh, small y. So for these two partial equations, if we take a look at the, the left one, it has k squared X let's say k is a pos positive number. So when um, this is a positive constant here, then the solution for x is a combination of um, a constant times exponential of e, uh, kx and then plus a constant times exponential of negative kx. So similarly, um, y could be written in a sine cosine combination. That's their solution. We're going to use it frequently in our uh, future lectures about the uh, variable separation. So here we're going to kind of simplify or modify Laplace equation into some simpler equations using the method of variable separations. Because the reason we do this is because uh, Laplace equation is widely used in, in this course, because usually when you do some uh, calculations for a phi or the electrostatic potential in a, either a 2D space or 3D space. The most common thing is 3D space. Then you sometimes you have either two variables, X and Y, or three variables, X, Y, and D. When there are multiple uh, variables in a big function, it becomes very complicated to solve that function. However, if there is a way that we can separate those functions into three uh, different functions, sorry, separate the function with three variables into three different functions and each function contains only one variable, then that will be much easier to get the solution. So this is why we're going to introduce the separation of variables. Have you learned the separation of variables in your previous courses? Okay, then we can go through it faster. Okay, so which class have you been? Uh, have you learned this separation of variables? In which class? Do you remember? In what? Oh, in your math course. Okay. Okay. Then if you learn it in a math course, then it's great. Now we're going to use it in a physics problem. Let's see how to use it in such a physics problem. Suppose you have uh, infinite grounded metal plates, which is shown shown here and here. There are two plates and they are parallel to the X, X, Z plane. One at Y equals to zero, which is the lower one and the upper one, it, 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 it is located at Y equals to A. The left end at X 
is actually equal to zero, which is shown here. It is closed off with an infinity strip insulated from the two plates and maintained at the specific potential uh, V zero. Find the potential inside the slot. Then what are we going to do? Now we know there are two parallel plates and then we know V here is zero, here is zero. And then there is one more plate which is perpendicular to those two plates. And the potential on that plate is V zero. And we're asked to find the potential distribution inside the slot. So first of all, um, let's say this plate could be considered at uh, infinitely large uh, plate. So in this case, we can consider this 3D uh, distribution of potential into a two-dimensional distribution of the uh, potential because let's say in, in Z direction, where we can imagine that in Z direction, it should be, everything should be constant, right? In, in Z direction, nothing is going to change. The only thing matter is in Y direction and Z direction. You can think about when um, your test point is moving along either X direction or a Y direction, then the potential should be different, but when you move your test point along the uh, Z direction, due to the symmetry, everything should be the same. Then you convert, you can convert this into a two dimensional case. So this is what we wanna start. We wanna start our method uh, with a very simple example, which is the simplest example, of course, is two dimensional problem. Now, uh, once you have this system set, set up, then uh, in order to solve the two dimensional phi distribution or potential distribution, uh, what we can do is using the Laplace equation, and we know, uh, We know for the Laplace equation, you can write it in this way, it equals to zero on the right side. And please be careful that we're talking about the space in the slot. And then when it's in the slot, you will have some boundary conditions that you can use to uh, limit it, to limit the, the uh, solutions of your uh, problem. So first condition, let's say when uh, X is far away from uh, this zero or origin, when X is infinitely far away, what's the potential? Zero, yeah. And what are the other conditions can we use? So there are totally four boundary, right? We have already considered the, one of the boundary which is infinitely far away. On the other side, the other boundary is when X equals to zero. So what's the condition for X equals to zero? What's the uh, potential? It's V zero, okay. And now what about the other condition? When Y is zero, what's the potential? It's zero. And then when Y is A, Y equals to A, then V equals to zero. Now you have four boundary conditions, which are listed here, one, two, three, four. And you have this Laplace equation. So how to solve this equation? 
Is there a way to solve it analytically or manually? Hmm? Separation parameters. Yes. Yes, we can solve it by separation, by using the separation of uh, parameters or separation of variables. Now, this is the inter, this is the example to introduce our method of separation of variables. So here, uh, let's define this V into uh, a product of two separate functions because now V is complicated. V is a function of both X and Y. This is only for a 2D problem. For a 3D problem, it will be a function of X, Y, Z. That's even more complicated. And here you see, it's only a Laplace equation. So on the right side, it's zero. But in a more complicated master, uh, complicated system, for example, if you put some charges, positive charges here, negative charges here, what happens? If you put any charges in the system, then the Laplace equation is even more complicated. It becomes a Poisson equation because you have some terms on the right side. It's a distribution of charge. It will make your um, calculation even more complicated in three-dimensional cases. And it's only in physics, in the real space, it's 3D, 3D case. But in mathematics, if it's not a physics problem in the real space, it might be more than three variables, which, which makes it even more complicated. So we're thinking of, can we make it easier? So one way is, is there a method that we can define another two functions so that uh, those two, the product of those two functions to be your V or your, uh, your original function here. And uh, for those two uh, functions, we want it to be, uh, we want each function to have only one parameter. Then you will success. You will be successfully um, separating a complicated function into several simple functions. So now let's try. What we can do is let's define v x y function of x and y into two functions x and y. X is function of x. Y is function of y. And we define v is a product of x and y. And then uh, the Laplace equation becomes, if you take x, y into v, what you get is you get, ignore the red writing, just uh, let's focus on the, uh, the black uh, letters. So you have this equation. So this is simply when you, uh, take the product, uh, take x and y product to here, substitute v, you will get, get it here. Now, um, this is not very helpful because you see on the left side, you have y and x, you have two separate functions. On the right side, I had two separate functions. But the good thing is, um, if you multiply the equation with one over x, y, then what you get is you will get the function shown here. So on the left side, this time you only have the function of x and on the right side of the uh, plus sign, you will have function of only y. Now, this is a function, this is another function. Two functions which, has, uh, which have two different variables and those two variables are independent from each other. In this case, 
For example, if we define the left term to be fx, the right term to be gy, notice that x and y are completely independent from each other. If x fx plus gy equals to zero, then what happens? So fx needs to be a negative number, g needs to be a positive number or verse y, right? Actually, it's not the right. Let's say if x and y, they depend on each other, then that's true. When x is, when f is, uh, when fx is a negative number, y must be a positive number. However, x and y, they are independent from each other. Let's say if x equals to a negative number, gy, g can still be positive or negative or zero. It can be different numbers because g is a function of y. y is independent from x. So even you fix fx, the gy can still be, let's say, uh, be a function of, of y and it could be resulted into different, different numbers. So the only way that you can make this function to be true, g fx plus gy to be zero, is that they both equals to zero. Only in this case, let's say fx is zero, gy is zero, only in this case, uh, you can make sure fx and plus gy is always zero. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So, so if fx plus gy equals zero and f and x and y are independent from each other, that means both fx and gy needs to be zero. The same thing for your original function. Now you have function of x, you have function of y. When the sum of them equals zero, that simply means uh, each term is zero. So this is the first case. F, F and G, they must be zero or constant. So the second case is it might not be um, completely zero, but if there's a way that you can fix, if there is a way that the, the function of x or fx to be a constant, which is positive, and gy is a function of y, but it always to be negative, and they're independent from each other to be constant, then that's another solution. Let's say it could be negative and this term to be positive, or it'd be positive to be gy to be negative. So in the three cases, zero, positive, negative, zero, negative, positive, in any of the three cases, fx and G, gy need always to be constant. So if we wanna generalize all of the three questions, uh, all of the three conditions, let's make it more general. Let's say the first term of x to be a constant of C, C1. C is just a constant that we, we define. So, um, and then uh, for the right term, let's define it to be C2, but C1 and C2 need to be zero. So for example, when C1 is zero, C2 has to be zero. Um, and when, of course, when C1 is positive, C2 need to be always um, negative. And please, be careful that it's constant for the function. So no matter what is your x, fx is always a constant. Only in this case, and gy need to be a, a, also a constant, a constant. Only in this case, your function here 
could be true. And then if we take a look at here and there, it's very similar to our uh, introduction function in the first slide, which is um, shown here. Now you have partial uh, differential equations. Um, we have written out its solution here and there. Then if we go back here, uh, from this equation, we can get a partial equation written here. From this equation, we can get it here. And of course, here we define uh, x to be a positive. Let's say the fx or the capital X to be a to be a positive constant, and y to be a negative constant. Actually, in the real case, we don't know. It might be um, um, in the opposite direction. In the opposite way, x function could be negative, but y could be positive. Uh, but in that case, you just switch x and y, you will get a similar solution. And the third case, if um, x equal to zero, the function of x equal to zero, and the function of y also equal to zero, then that's even uh, easier. So let's take a particular case that if uh, C1 is positive and C2 is negative. And then what we can do is uh, write it here. Let's define C1 to be K square and C2 to be negative K square because they have to be, the sum of them have to be zero. Once uh, we have this definition, then your equation here and there can be right can be written in, in those forms. We have already talked about the solution of the first partial equation, partial differential equation, and here, the second partial differential equation. For a positive number, k squared, your solution is exponential functions. And for this one, it's sine and cosine, or exponential of negative, um, let's say sine and cosine, functions. And then the problem is almost solved. You have successfully uh, divide a complicated function of x and y into two functions. One contain x only, the other contain y only. And luckily, you know the answers for each of the um, function. And you already written here. Now the combination of these two functions or the product of these two functions will be your original defined function, which is shown here, just a product of them. So that's the solution. That's a general solution. But when, when we solve a physics problem, especially for uh, this electrostatic problem, uh, what we can do is we can use our boundary conditions to uh, do some limitations to the solution so that you have uh, more limitation and less solutions. Now, if we look at this equation here, let's remind you about the four conditions. These are the four conditions. Uh, we introduced the condition in previous slides, but now let's take in all of the conditions uh, as boundary conditions in our equations so that we can simplify, we can uh, specifically modify our equations to be uh, more unique. So first of all, let's see the condition four. Condition four says when x equals to infinitely large, v is zero. Okay, when x is infinitely large, this term becomes what? Zero. What about this term? Infinitely large. So this is infinitely large, but v zero need to be zero. 
So the solution, oh, sorry, V, um, V need to be zero, but this term, this small term is infinitely large. So the only solution for uh, V equal to zero in this condition is A need to be zero because this B term is already zero. If A is also zero, then the problem is solved. So you have the X term to be zero. So no matter which Y you choose, it doesn't matter. It times a zero, it becomes zero. So we want to make this term to be zero so that A has to be zero. So considering condition four, then you get Z A to be zero. Once A is zero, what do you have? You have B times E to negative KX times these two terms, C term and D term. Uh, then you B and C, B times C, B times D, you can write it as B, C, B, D, but uh, since they're arbitrary uh, constant, let's say we combine a, a B, C to be a new C and B, D to be a new D. Actually, you can use any symbols, but here let's still use C and D. Here it says absorbing B into C and D. Actually, you can also consider there are two different symbol, but they use the same symbol, which is still C and D. Now your, your uh, equation here becomes a simplified equation because, um, because your A is zero. Okay, we have simplified the equation now. Is there anything more we can do to simplify it? Here, condition one, when Y is zero, V need to be zero. Now, if we look at this equation, uh, if Y is zero here and here, so sine KY equals to zero, right? Because Y is zero. What about cosine? It becomes a one, cosine zero is one. So you get uh, zero and D times one, which is D. And here, you see, this is the function of x. Uh, when y is zero, you want v to be zero, no matter what is x. That means you want the whole term here to be zero when y is zero. Then the value will be independent from x, no matter what is x, uh, no matter what's the value for this function, your, your v will always be zero. So, uh, let's say when x when x equals to when y equals to zero, then let's say here zero and here need to be zero. This term need to be zero. The only way to make it to be zero is d equal to zero because cosine y cannot be zero. So after this boundary condition or condition, you get a new uh, simplified equation because D zero, now you get V equals to C times a potential function, uh, exponential function times sine function. And the good thing is uh, the exponential function only have X and the sine function only have Y. We still have more uh, boundary conditions. Let's say boundary condition two, when y is a, v need to be zero. Now, y, when y is a, let's take a into this equation. It becomes sine k a. So when, when, a, when y is a, or your function need always to be zero, that means no matter what is x, once your y is zero, the whole function needs to be zero. That means this side, this is the function containing y, needs to be zero when uh, y is a. So in, in what case, 
you get the solution for uh, sine k a to the zero. The only thing is when k equals to n times pi over a, so that uh, sine n pi equals to uh, zero. Of course, n has to be integer numbers. Okay, now your solution is getting more and more detailed. K, now you have the K. Then finally, you have function of what? C times E to negative, let's say here, it equals negative N pi over A x times sine n pi over a times a y. So that's the final solution for uh, your electrostatic potential. But if you look at this equation, you have an integer number here. Means when your n is one, two, three, as long as the integer, uh, this equation or this, this equation shown here is a solution of your system, which is shown here. So how many solutions do you have now? You have infinity because n could be from one to infinity number. If it's an integer, then that satisfies the equation. Then what it can do is um, your final function could be a combination um, of all of the solutions. Let's say n from one to infinite number, but n has to be integer. Integer. So any of the solution, any of the equation shown here is a solution. When you combine the solutions scattered due to the linear combination rule, you still have uh, this to be uh, the solution of your function. Okay, so then that's the, um, final solution for your complicated, uh, let's say electrostatic potential distribution. Do you have any questions? Okay, good. Uh, so we have another, okay. So after this separation of variables, let's do a practice here. It's very similar to our um, um, example shown previously, but this time what, what is different is, now you have one more wall here instead of uh, just three walls, now you have four walls, but still it's a two dimensional cases. Uh, let me see. Okay. If you don't have any questions for the uh, lecture, actually I'll leave this example to you. You can just read it by yourself. It's a, it's a one more wall shown on the right side, but actually the solution might not be uh, more complicated. The good thing is sometimes more boundary conditions, more limits for the solutions, the easier solution or the, 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 the fewer solutions you may have. Okay, then I guess that's it for today. So I prefer to leave it for you.
to read it rather than we go through it together because we read it by yourself. I think it's uh, uh, the impression will be even deeper. Okay, so far, do you have any questions for our lectures? So one question. Um, I'm not too sure exactly where why the classification is coming in. Like why are Which we, one? Why are we working with the second derivative of the potential? Here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, or I guess just in general. You mean this step or here? Here. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't write it on Blackboard, otherwise it's not recorded. Now let's see, that's a good question. Let's see. Uh, now you have V, it's shown here, V equals to X and Y. X is the function of X, Y is function of Y. Now you can write this equation into, let's say, x times y over partial x squared. So um, this secondary, uh, let's say this is partial squared function to partial squared x. However, we have defined that y is only a function for small y. It's independent from x. So in this step, we can consider y to be a constant, right? So we can just write y to be a constant outside. And then Does that make sense? Okay, so this is the uh, left term. On the right term, you have similar thing. Um, you, you will get x, of course it's a function of x, partial squared y over squared small y. Of course, this is a function of y, and this is a function of x. This is a left term, this is a right term. The, this term plus this term equals zero. So which is exactly the same you see here. Okay. So. And then so before that, are we feeling like Gradient of the potential is that what we think this? You mean what? You mean you mean this equation? Yeah, it would be like del squared d, right? Zero. Del squared what? Del squared of, of d. Yes, yes. To be zero. But here. Um, in order to write it into um, x and y, we separate them into, into this format, but actually this is the same. This is just the Laplace equation. No problem. Okay, so if no questions, then that's it for today. So I'll send you another homework um, either tonight or tomorrow night. And you will still have one week to solve it.